everybody. Glad you could all join us tonight. And um, uh, this is the third program in our Grow Big Red virtual learning series. Um, and so we're glad that you could join us. We're going to focus primarily on tomato problems tonight, as you could tell from the title. But we're only going to be um, uh, talking uh, with like a formal presentation for about the first 20 or 25 minutes. And then we'll leave it open for more discussion. So if you have other questions, whether they're related to tomatoes or other plants in your vegetable garden, uh, you know, we've got lots of time to talk about um, other issues that you might be having. And if you have questions as we go along, please just go ahead and put them in the chat box. And um, my colleagues will try to help keep me on task and make sure that I, I see uh, all your questions and we get them answered. Um, so I, I guess, John, before I actually get started with the presentation here, do we want to go quickly and introduce uh, ourselves, um, all of the Nebraska Extension uh, colleagues that we have on the, on the presentation tonight? I guess I could just kick it off and say, um, um, my name is Sarah Browning. I'm the Horticulture Extension Educator, and I'm based in the Lancaster office. So I work out of Lincoln, and um, uh, that's where you can find me. So I will let my additional colleagues go ahead and introduce themselves as well. Well, I am John Porter. I'm the Urban Agriculture Program Coordinator, and I'm located in our Omaha office, Douglas R.P. County. Elizabeth, you want to go next? Sure. I am Elizabeth Ekstrom. I'm located in the Hall County office in Grand Island, and I am the horticulture educator for Central Nebraska. Nicole? Hi, I'm Nicole Stoner. Um, I'm the horticulture educator in Gage County, and so I take care of Southeast Nebraska for uh, horticulture issues. So. And you guys are the only ones I can see on my screen. So I know we've got um, we've got Kyle with us, and I think Jody was going to be joining. So anyone else, just jump in and and introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Kyle Broderick. I coordinate the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. So I'm located in, in Lincoln, but have have statewide responsibilities. And this is my pathologist in training, Lillian. <laughs> Um, I'm Jody Green. I'm the entomologist and I'm located in Omaha for Douglas RP County. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, this is Terry James. Um, <clears throat> I'm at, uh, I am in Lincoln, but I am housed um, on campus. So. I think I saw Katie. Kreuzer was on. Did I see you? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Kreuzer. I'm an extension educator based in Cass County. Um, sorry, I'm not in a place to turn my camera on tonight. So I'm hanging in the background. All right. All right. Well, if that's everyone, we'll go ahead and, and, and jump into our tomato troubles presentation tonight. And um, Nicole, you want to go to the next slide? So, you know, unfortunately, there's lots of different problems that can go wrong with tomatoes. And I, I uh, chose some of the most common uh, that we get questions about and that I see in vegetable gardens to talk about tonight. And I've grouped these based, the, well, the first group that we're going to talk about basically are diseases, the common diseases that we see in tomatoes. So leaf diseases, the three most common that we see are early blight, septoria leaf spot, and bacterial spot or speck. Then we're going to talk a little bit about viruses, and I've just got two, of, two listed here, and then a little bit about the wilts as well. Um, and so uh, I'm going to wait to talk about control kind of after we take a look at, at these different diseases uh, because one of the things I want you to get out of tonight is just to be able to maybe recognize a little bit what you might be seeing in your plants when you when these diseases occur in the garden. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, Nicole. Okay, so starting off with the leaf diseases here. Um, so on your left is a picture of a leaf with early blight. And early blight is one of the, the most common fungal diseases that we see on tomatoes. 
And um, with the, the first two, early blight and septoria leaf spot, it's very, very common to see these diseases start on the lowest leaves of the plants. And so typically what people will say, or what gardeners will see in their garden, is that the lowest leaves of the plants will, will get these spots, and then the leaves will turn yellow and they'll turn brown, and then gradually the disease will move up the plant. And depending on the weather conditions that we're having, the disease might move slow or it might move more quickly. Um, but so the first disease, early blight, if you can take a close look at the lesions on those leaves, you might be able to see concentric rings. And this is one good diagnostic feature of early blight is that where the fungal spore lands on the leaves, it, it will infect the tissue and it will kill that tissue, but then it, it keeps enlarging. And so you get these concentric rings as the lesion gets bigger and bigger. Now they're not always perfect, you know, almost circular, which they are on this particular leaf. Sometimes the, the lesions expand in a really irregular shape, but you'll still be able to see those concentric rings as the lesions get bigger and bigger. And it's very common also with early blight to see that yellowing, the yellowing of the tissue around the lesions uh, that hasn't actually turned brown yet. Um, eventually it will. So this is a very common, um, uh, uh, these symptoms, these lesions that you're seeing in that picture are very common for early blight. Um, and you do have to look pretty closely at the leaves to see them. You know, you have to get right down there and, and pick a leaflet and look for those, those lesions. Now the, the, the leaf in the middle is septoria leaf spot. And the way that these lesions are usually described is that in the center of the lesion, you'll see that, that lightish, uh, almost white or a very light tan in the center of the lesion. And then the edges around the light, the, the whitish part are darker. You know, they're a darker brown color usually. And sometimes when you have leaves that are very heavily infected, these lesions will coalesce and, and, and almost the whole leaf will turn brown, okay? but you won't see those concentric rings like you see with the early blight, okay? Now the first two diseases, early blight and septoria leaf spot are, are pretty much exclusively foliage diseases. They don't infect the fruits directly, but what they can do is they can cause enough leaf death that eventually the plants just become unproductive and the tomatoes that might be on your plants are exposed to so much sun that you end up with sun scald and they don't, they don't ripen well because there aren't enough carbohydrates and sugars. But, the, but, these, but you won't see fungal lesions from these two diseases. The third disease on your far right, which is bacterial speck, you see lesions on both the leaves and the fruits. So you can see in, in, um, on the leaf, you've got these really, really tiny little dark brown spots. In fact, when you see them on a tomato leaf in the field, oftentimes these little spots almost look black. They're just very dark colored. And then you can see on that tomato uh, uh, above, you see also little black lesions on the fruits themselves. Um, uh, sometimes the lesions in bacterial spec can be raised. So if you run your thumb or your finger over it, you can feel kind of a little raised uh, surface to that lesion. And they don't go into the fruits. They don't go in and cause the fruit to rot, but they just, they just make the fruits look a little bit, um, look a little bad. You know, they don't look perfect. They don't look like a perfect tomato. And if you were growing tomatoes to sell at a farmer's market, uh, tomatoes with bacterial spec are, are, are not desirable. You know, people don't want to see these little lesions on the fruits, even though they don't really go any further than that, okay? So I guess what I, what I first wanted you to get out of these pictures is not to be able to identify, oh yeah, that's septoria leaf spot, or oh, that's bacterial speck. I just wanted you to be able to, to take a look at a leaf and say, okay, that's probably one of the leaf spot diseases, and then go from there. Uh, because fortunately, controlling the diseases with all of these, these three uh, diseases is pretty much the same. So uh, 
it's not terribly critical that you be able to pinpoint, you know, which one it is, um, early blight, septoria leaf spot, or bacterial spec, okay? So um, any questions that anybody have about these before we move on? And we're gonna talk more about control here, but I'm gonna wait until we take a look at a few more pictures before we get to that. Okay. So I'm not seeing any questions there, coming up. There was a question a while ago about um, the leaves at the bottom of the plant turning yellow. And I wondered if maybe that was one of these diseases, if you wanted yes. to kind of. Yes, it very likely was. Um, very likely was one of these diseases. Now in, in field tomatoes, um, I've often seen bacterial spec uh, not, be, not, not be restricted to the base of the plant. It, it can occur anywhere on the plant if as long as weather conditions are right. But septoria leaf spot and early blight almost always start at the bottom of the plant. And those, those leaves, those oldest leaves will be the first ones that become infected and then the disease will just move up the plant. And so that yellowing from the bottom is very common. Okay, so I, I do see a question. What's the difference between early blight and late blight in tomatoes? Good question. So um, early blight, I guess, I guess the biggest difference is um, one of the things is weather. Late blight is a disease that we see coming in when conditions are cooler and, and rather wet. So we had conditions a few years ago where the end of the summer, it, it suddenly turned really cool and wet. And we, we saw an outbreak of late blight um, at, on tomatoes and potatoes and other plants in the vegetable garden. Late blight causes a very dramatic, almost, almost um, immediate collapse of the plant. Um, and when I say immediate, I have to backtrack on that a little bit because it's not like you know in a matter of hours. But over the course of a few days, the plants will get these black lesions on the stems and um, on the fruits, and the, the plants will just wilt and die very quickly. Okay, so, ba but based on our summer weather conditions, we don't see late blight very often. It's much, much more common for us to see early blight because early blight is, is favored by warm temperatures you know, um, 80, 85 are great temperatures for early blight and high humidity. And so those are the conditions that we see for that disease. Okay. Okay, so Nicole, you wanna go on to the next slide? So the next thing we wanted to look at were viruses. And I just picked out a couple here, tomato mosaic and tomato spotted wilt virus because they're fairly common. But what I wanted you to see here in these pictures, and starting with the picture on the left, is that a virus infection sometimes does not give you very dramatic symptoms. What we're seeing in this leaf on the left is basically just kind of a modeling, a, a modeling of, of light green and dark green in the leaf. And sometimes that's one of the only symptoms that you'll really see. Um, sometimes uh, virus infected plants can be stunted, so the plants can be much shorter or much bushier than they typically would be on a healthy plant. Sometimes the, the leaf tissue will become rather thick and leathery, so that the, the texture of the leaf tissue is, is quite different. And then oftentimes in virus infected plants, they don't bloom well. So either they don't bloom they just don't produce flower clusters at all. Or when they do, the, the flowers don't set. The flowers will open and then they'll fall off and you don't get much fruit set. So that can also be a, a very characteristic of a virus infection. Now in the middle and the right hand picture, you can see the tomato spotted wilt virus. And in this particular virus, we see rather dramatic symptoms on the fruits themselves where you see those kind of circular um, discoloration of the skin of the tomato. And you can see it both in the, in the um, unripe tomato and in the ripe tomato uh, as well. Uh, and so um, this kind of dramatic uh, discoloration of the tomatoes themselves can be an indication of a virus, okay? 
So again, these are just a couple of viruses. There's, there's many others <clears throat> that we can see in the vegetable garden, but these are two of the most common. <coughs> okay. So let's go on and look at some pictures, Nicole, of the last group of diseases, and those are the wilts. So with the wilts, we have um, fusarium wilt, and we also have verticillium wilt. Now, in a home garden, um, telling these two diseases apart can be very, very difficult. Um, so you may not be able to determine, okay, do I have fusarium or do I have verticillium? And honestly, again, that is not super critical for you to figure out which one you have because management of the two is going to be the same, okay? Um, let me backtrack here a minute because I see Jane, Jane had a question about, uh, are tomatoes with virus okay to eat? Yes, they are. Um, tomatoes that, are, that do grow or are produced on a virus infected plant, that virus will not affect you at all. Um, but what we do find sometimes is with, with plants that have some kind of a disease, whether it's a severe leaf, uh, leaf infection or if it's a virus, um, that the tomatoes may not develop the, the, um, the pH level that they typically would develop on a healthy plant. And so you have to be more careful if you're canning tomatoes that come off of a disease infected plant. In fact, we would typically tell you not to can or preserve those tomatoes, to eat them fresh. And then um, if you're gonna do some canning, just do it with, uh, with tomatoes from healthy plants. That way you don't run any risk of having um, you know, a low pH that could result in easier pathogens like botulism or something in the tomato product that you're canning, okay? But otherwise they're okay to eat, okay? Um, so here in these pictures, um, basically with the wilts, typical symptoms would be, as you see in the left-hand picture, Okay, I'm back again. Sorry about that. And Nicole, can you hear yep. me okay? Yep, you're good. Keep on okay. going. You're, you're back. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. I wasn't sure. Yep. Um, so typical symptoms. As you see in that tomato on the, on the left, uh, we have some leaves that are yellowing. And oftentimes in the first stages of a, of a wilt infection, it might just be one stalk, one branch of a tomato, or sometimes it might even be just one, one leaf. And in, in a really curious case, sometimes on a leaf, you'll see just the leaflets on one side of the leaf will be turning yellow. But then eventually it progresses. And what you'll see is that branch will start to wilt during the day. And during the first few uh, days of infection, the, the plant might recover at night. So it might look good again the following day but then it wilts again. And this wilt gets progressively worse until as you can see in the picture on the right, you've got the majority of the plant is wilting and then eventually the whole plant just collapses and just wilts and dies. Um, and so that's, th that's what you typically would see. If you took a stem from one of these plants and you slid it open, as you see in the middle picture, uh, you might see this faint brown discoloration of where the cambium tissue is, the, the, the vascular xylem and phloem. And that is a, uh, a symptom of, of, of a wilt infection, okay? All right, so let's go on to the next, the next slide, Nicole. Um, so let's talk about control then, okay? Um, with the leaf diseases, um, one of the most important things is to try to keep the foliage dry. And of course, we know you can't do anything about rain and we can't do very much about dew. Um, plant leaves are gonna get, gonna get wet during those periods. But it's really important uh, to, when you're watering or you're irrigating to try to keep the foliage dry. So you're just, you're just irrigating your plants at the base around the roots. Now, we can also talk about things like plant spacing, because if you space your plants out 
uh, well enough in the garden, you're going to get good air movement, good air flow through the plants. And if we have a heavy dew or a rain, uh, those plants will dry out quickly because they'll have good air movement between the plants and that really helps a lot. So keeping the foliage dry uh, is critical in, in reducing these leaf diseases. Um, and I guess the way that I put my, my control techniques together here, I started off with, okay, what can you do right now? So keep your plants dry. The other thing that you can do is to remove infected leaves um, because we know that the, the leaves become infected and then if it rains, the rain drops will splash on those infected leaves and they will splash the fungal spores up to the leaves above them and that is one way that the disease progresses up the plant is through rain splash. Um, uh, so removing those infected leaves uh, can be one way to slow the disease down, okay? Um, you might then, if your plants are, are heavily infected or if the disease seems to be progressing quickly, you may need to resort to a fungicide spray program. And um, one of the the um, fungicides that we use very commonly in the vegetable garden is liquid copper. And uh, I have some product names listed for you at the end of the presentation, so we'll come to that. Um, but that would, liquid copper is a good general purpose fungicide and it works fairly well against some of these leaf spot diseases. So the typical spray schedule would be to spray your plants every seven to 14 days, depending on how a wet or humid of a period that we're in. The more rainy uh, weather we have, uh, the shorter your spray schedule would need to be. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, then this fall, um, one of the most important things you can do is to get rid of those heavily infected plants because all of those leaves that were infected, uh, little bits of those leaves are gonna fall to the soil and um, uh, they will be there and they will produce fungal structures that will uh, reinfect your plants next year. So if you plant your tomatoes back into the same garden area uh, that had diseased plants last year, um, the, the chances that they're going to be reinfected the following year get greater and greater. In fact, there's been some research that's shown uh, that uh, when rotation is not used uh, in the garden, plants become infected with diseases earlier every year and they become more heavily infected in every subsequent year. So get rid of those heavily infected plants. That's important. And don't put them in the compost pile uh, because typically most home garden compost piles don't get hot enough to kill off all those, those disease uh, pathogens, whether it's fungal spores or bacterial, uh, bacterial structures, okay? Um, then think about a good rotation schedule. And with the leaf diseases, a three to four year rotation is what's typically recommended. Now keep in mind that you can't just rotate from one corner of a garden to, to another corner, especially if you're uh, tilling up your whole garden uh, at some point in the season, whether you do that in the fall or in the spring, because you're just basically mixing those fungal structures or those disease pathogens throughout the whole garden. Um, so you almost need to rotate from one garden plot to a totally disconnected garden plot, or you could rotate from a garden plot into containers, or you could rotate over years. So maybe one year you have a heavy tomato crop production, the next year you do melons, the next year you do sweet corn and, and onions, just so that you're rotating through different vegetable families to help to keep those disease um, uh, populations in the soil under control, okay? Um, then with the viruses and the wilts, uh, you know, the, the control measures are much simpler. And basically it's what uh, we, we like to say on backyard farmers, basically rogue it out. Um, there, there is no effective spray program for a virus or a wilt. Uh, there's no way to cure these plants. So it's better to just get them out of your garden so that, so that the disease doesn't move on to other plants. The viruses are typically spread from plant to plant through insect feeding, like leaf hoppers are one of the big vectors for uh, vegetable viruses. And so it's important to just get the plants out as soon as you can, okay? 
Then the following year, think about resistant cultivars. Now, fortunately, with the wilts and the viruses, there are plants out there that have good resistance. So, you know, look for tomatoes that have verticillium resistance and fusarium resistance. If you know you've had these diseases in your garden in, in years past, um, and, and um, uh, that will help you out tremendously uh, to keep these diseases under control. There's also good cultivars that have resistance to some of the viruses, like tomato spotted wilt, wilt virus and mosaic virus. So, um, you know, do some research over the winter months if you have had these diseases in the past and find the cultivars that are going to provide you the resistance uh, that you need for those diseases. Now, I do have to say one, one thing about resistance is that resistance doesn't mean immunity. So if the pathogen load is extremely high in a garden, even a resistant plant could become infected, okay? Uh, so just keep that in mind, all right? Um, let's see, we've got a question here from Nikki. Does Nebraska tomato production at risk for bacterial canker, bacterial speck, uh, or candida psychobacter. Um, definitely bacterial speck and spot. I've seen a lot of that in commercial production fields. Um, and uh, thanks, Kyle. Thanks for jumping in on the bacterial canker. I'm not sure about the last one, uh, the Candiditas liberacta. I'm not familiar with that one. So Kyle, if you want to jump in on that, that one would be great. Yeah, um, so that is a phytoplasma. The, uh, the Candidetus uh, libericter, liber um, and that is a, it's basically a vi uh, bacteria that behaves kind of like a virus. And as far as I know, that's only been confirmed um, in Florida and possibly California. I don't think we have that in Nebraska. Thank you very much. So Nicole, we can go on to the next slide. There was a question about um, diseases that are airborne versus soilborne. She was, uh, Lisa was wondering which ones are airborne and which ones are soilborne. Well, airborne, I wouldn't really say any of them are airborne. Um, the leaf diseases will overwinter in the soil on infected plant debris, so bits of infected leaves um, and such. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, typically they're spread, first of all, through rain splash or through you working in the garden and, and spreading the uh, pathogen from the soil or from one infected plant to another. Um, so not really so much that the, the spores are floating around in the air. But again, with the, the viruses, uh, that's primarily insect spread. So you have a, a plant that has uh, infected with a virus, leaf hoppers, feed on that plant, they move on to another plant, and they can spread the virus through their feeding. All right. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, insects, and then we're going to wrap up with some uh, abiotic problems that we typically see on, um, on tomatoes. So I, again, I divided this up into leaf damage and fruit damage. So where are, she, where are you seeing the problems on the plants? And with the leaf damage, one of the most common insects that I see is two-spotted spider mites. In fact, I've had some samples into my extension office here this last week that were pretty heavily infected with um, spider mite uh, feeding. And spider mites are very tiny little, um, uh, almost arachnid-like uh, insects. They have a mouth like a straw and they stick their mouth into the leaf and then they suck out the liquid contents of the cells and their feeding causes this very characteristic little yellow speckling. In fact, I think I'm getting ahead of myself because I think I have a picture here in just a minute. Um, so we'll talk a little more about spider mites and then we're gonna talk about fruit damage from things like corn worms, fruit worms and stink bugs, okay? So let's go on to the next slide, Nicole. Okay, so here are some pictures to show you what spider mite damage would look like. Um, the picture on the left is, is a uh, plant that is in sort of medium stage of spider mite feeding. And you can see those little tiny yellow pinpricks in the leaf, which indicates that the mites are feeding there. And the mites are almost always going to be on the undersides of the leaves. And if you want to know if you have spider mites on your plants, 
you can take a piece of white paper out to the garden and you can shake the leaf over the paper, real tap it real sharply. And then when you take the leaf away, what you're gonna look for are these little tiny specks, like specks of dust, and they will start crawling around on the page. And that would indicate that you have spider mites, okay? Now the picture in the middle is, is uh, showing you a, a very, very heavy infestation where you're actually seeing a slight bit of webbing between the leaflets and the main leaf midrib. It's, it's, this, has to, this plant has to be pretty heavily infected with mites before you would ever see this type of webbing uh, occurring. Um, and then the picture on the right is showing the feeding damage on the, fruit, on the tomato fruits themselves. The mites here feed in the same way that they feed on the leaves. And so you see these, these little yellow specks on the skin of the tomato that indicates that the mite is feeding there. Okay, so um, spider mite control can be a little difficult in the vegetable garden because we don't have a very, really, we don't have many good insecticides that are, are great at controlling spider mites. And, and Jody, jump in here if, if you have anything to add on the mites. Um, one thing that you can do that can help to slow down their reproduction is to syringe the plants. So if you take a, a strong jet of water and once a day or even twice a day, morning and, and afternoon on a plant that's infected, spray the plants down really well with water. And that's going to wash some of the mites off and it's going to make the leaves a little more wet and cool, which is a, not a favored environment for spider mites. And so it might help to um, slow down their reproduction. Um, Julie is asking about neem oil. Um, you, you can try neem oil. I think you might have moderate success with that. Um, it certainly won't you know, give you 100% kill. And do you, remember, you do need to be careful with anything you spray, even if it's, a, it's something considered organic or a plant-based pesticide, if you spray when air temperatures are too hot because you could end up burning the leaves of the foliage. So we, we always recommend not to spray anything if the air temperature is above 85 uh, to avoid any leaf burning, okay? Uh, so Jane is asking, Syringing would be similar to overhead watering. True, that's very true. Um, and so, yeah, we're trying, to, we're trying to battle the spider mites, but not get our plants infected with leaf disease. And so we are in kind of a catch-22 here. Um, honestly, in some cases, my recommendation is if the plant is not that important, I would just yank the tomato out and get rid of it when I know that spider mites are building up because spider mites can be so difficult to control in a vegetable garden. Um, I would rather get rid of that plant and prevent it from moving on to the other plants in my vegetable garden than try to control it. So, you know, it's, it's something to think about, okay? okay? So let's go on to the next slide, Nicole. And I think we're gonna look at some of the fruit damage. And so um, here we've got three different culprits that can cause damage to our fruits. And you may have seen uh, uh, the one on the left uh, is pretty common, to tobacco or tomato hornworm. Those are actually two different species of hornworms. We have both of them in Nebraska. Um, and it doesn't matter which one you have. <laughs> they're, they're, they do the same kind of damage. Uh, they're hard to find, even though they're big. Um, they're, they're kind of the size of a, like a baby mini carrot, you know, that you would get at the grocery store uh, or maybe even a little bit longer. So they're pretty big, but their coloration blends in really well with the foliage colors. And so it can be hard to find them. Um, they will leave behind their frass, which are uh, little black uh, round uh, droppings. And sometimes if you can find the droppings, you can narrow down where the hornworm is in your plant. Uh, so they feed on the leaves and then when you have fruits on they will also feed on the tomatoes themselves so you have to watch out for them in both uh, situations then the the uh, critter in the middle is um, what we call a fruit worm or aka corn earworm so this is the larva of a moth and we have plenty of them in nebraska since we have so much corn um, and uh, they do love to feed on tomatoes and oftentimes they'll chew a hole in the side of a tomato and they won't, 
they won't go in and, and burrow in the tomato, but they'll move on to the next tomato and they'll chew a hole in the side of that one too. So they'll just kind of move from uh, tomato to tomato uh, and cause quite a bit of damage. Then the picture on the right, uh, you see a stink bug. And, and in this case, it's a green stink bug. We have several different species of stink bugs in Nebraska. Um, the feeding damage that they cause is, is very similar, no matter what species of stink bug it is. And, and you can see that the um, yellowish speckling on that tomato is, is a very characteristic type of feeding we would see from stink bugs. So here again, this tomato could certainly be eaten. There's no reason that you couldn't eat it if, the, um, if you didn't have a secondary uh, fruit rot. I think we lost Sarah again for a moment. <laughs> so we see that stink bug damage there. Uh, and you know it causes those blemishes on there. The fruit is still edible, like she said, but it can open up a pathway for other things to happen. Uh, so you want to be watching out for that. Right. We'll cross our fingers that Sarah hops back on any second now. Thanks, John. I'm back. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, thanks. Thanks for talking about the stink bug damage there. Sometimes if the damage is really extensive, you can get some secondary fruit rots and the, and the tomato will just rot. And then of course, at that point, it's, it looks horrible and you're not gonna wanna eat it anyway. Okay. So let's go on to the next slide, Nicole. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about just general control for these kinds of, uh, of critters. And, um, you know, you can hand pick, if it's something big like a hornworm, you can hand pick them. Um, uh, you know, with, in many cases, um, you might need to resort to an insecticide if you want to, you know, really keep your, your plants clean, or if you're willing to tolerate a, a certain amount of damage, that's fine too. And you can just discard those fruits that have the insect damage and just harvest the ones that, that are looking fine. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I would give you kind of a listing of some of the common garden pest control products that you're gonna find available at the garden centers. And so that's what you have listed here. Um, in the insecticides, carbaryl has been a product that we've used for many, many years in the vegetable garden. And then more recently, we have permethrin, uh, which is sold as eight, uh, which is um, uh, a good product that provides control of, um, neither of these will do very much in the way of control for spider mites. So um, I don't use it for that. But for the other insects we've talked about, they could help with control. Then um, uh, uh, Spinosad um, is available in a couple of different formulations. The Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew is a product that I've seen a lot in the garden centers in recent years. Um, and so that would be one that you could try. Uh, with the, the insects that are moth larvae, the hornworms and the, the fruit worms, uh, a Bacillus thuringiensis product can help you control those. And there's both a Monterey and a Bonide formulation of BT, uh, which is um, a very safe product, very environmentally friendly, um, and will give you good control. So that would be something that you could try. Um, then I've also listed for you there some of the common garden fungicides that you'll be able to find in the garden centers. I already mentioned the liquid copper as one option, but there's also chlorthalonil, uh, Mancozeb, and then again, neem oil. And neem, um, neem oil is used as a fungicide and an insecticide, so it can work um, in both, both instances, okay? Um, Brittany is asking if there is an, an effective insecticide for grasshoppers. Um, that's a difficult question, Brittany. Oh, I think we lost her again. <laughs> we lost her again. Do any of our insecty people want to jump on? Do so, oh, there we go. Well, the, and this is Nicole, most of your general insecticides are going to work pretty well with them, but with grasshoppers, you may have to look at um, spraying in like the, the ditches and taller grass areas as well for grasshoppers because they, that's kind of where they're going to spend a little more of their time.
Terry, you um, back on? I'm back now. I, oh, I didn't know if, if Jody wanted to jump in, if Jody had any comments yeah, about yeah. the grasshoppers. Yeah. No, I, well, I mean, I think what Nicole said, a lot of times you're not going to want to spray those on your plants. And so it's going to be the areas around the garden where there's going to be like long grass and treat there where they're going to be resting. Yeah. It's going to be it, more general broad spectrum. And it, it's difficult to kill grasshoppers when they're adults. You yes. Know, you, you really, really need to focus on controlling them when they're young. Um, before they reach, what, what Jody is the recommendation? Is it before they're a half an inch long? I actually don't know the exact uh, instar or length, but okay. yeah, I mean, they, they can just move away from that area so fast and fly pretty far. Yeah, but if you catch them when they're young, before they have wings, they're a little bit more sedentary. They, they kind of stay in a smaller area and you might have more success at killing them if you, if you do it when they're young. Okay, so we want to go on to the next slide, Nicole. I am being very long-winded tonight. I apologize because I wanted to give time for everybody to get in with questions. So real briefly, these are three very common problems that we see in tomatoes. And earlier on, we were talking about blossom end rot, which is the picture in the top left. Very, very common. It's caused by a calcium deficiency that occurred when the tomatoes were developing. Typically, it's because um, there was not enough water available to the plant. Calcium is a, is a nutrient that has limited, uh, it's, it's limited water solubility. And so it doesn't move in plants well unless the plants have a lot of water or sufficient water. Or sometimes we see it in plants that have been very heavily fertilized because in those heavily fertilized plants, uh, the calcium that the plant pulls up will go to the new growth and not to the tomatoes. And so then we'll see blossom end rot. So it's very common to see the first few tomatoes of the season have blossom end rot, but then as the plants uh, start, start growing and, and being more vigorous, later tomatoes in the season will not have it. So that's very common. But just water management, keeping your plants evenly moist, making sure they have a mulch on them to hold moisture in the soil. The mulch is also going to help you with disease control because it will prevent that rain splash that will you know, cause the leaf in infections of those lower leaves. So water management is the main issue with blossom end rot. You can find products at the garden centers uh, called, called blossom end rot stopper. Save your money because they don't work. Uh, tomatoes do not take calcium in well through the foliage or through the fruits, so they, they don't work. Um, the picture in the bottom, we're showing you some fruit cracking. And this is very common in tomatoes as, they, as they're nearing maturity. If we get a big influx of rain or heavy irrigation uh, that the plants can't accommodate, and then they'll crack like this. If you're having a lot of trouble with fruit cracking, there are cultivars of tomatoes that have been bred to have increased resistance to fruit cracking. Um, uh, and so that would be another uh, good uh, thing for you to investigate over the winter is to look for cultivars with resistance to fruit cracking, okay? And then the image in the top right is a picture of sun scald where you have just this kind of flat whitish colored discoloration of the fruit. And this will happen quite often if we have a big storm that comes through and the foliage all gets pushed over to one side, and now the, the, the tomatoes are suddenly in the sun where they weren't before. Or if you are having a leaf disease and, and so many of the leaves have died that the tomatoes are now exposed to direct sun, and then you'll end up with something like sun scald. So just foliage management is the biggest issue uh, to help prevent this in the garden. 